we were waiting for Michael O'Keefe, our uh, um, district attorney. He's one of our panelists, and he's coming from Boston, so he's just held up a little bit. So we'll just start anyway. <coughs> so I just want to say good evening, and thank you so much for being here tonight. Is it on? It doesn't sound like it's on. I Looks like it's on. Yeah. Now it's off. It's on. Yeah. Can you hear me? Bring it closer. Yeah, we bring it closer. Bring it closer to you. Can you hear me now? No. No. Looks like a bad commercial. The sprint commercial. Can you hear bring it really close? I think you might have to talk right into it. Okay. Can you hear me now? Uh, no. Hmm. Speakers. No. Well, it's it's all all wireless. That's what they told us, and this is what works. They said. Mm -hmm. um, so, I guess I'll just have to raise my voice. Okay, so, um, we will start. No, it's not. <laughs> Kevin will go check it out. Okay. Did you hear anything of this? Nothing. Nothing. There's a problem then. Have an AV person. Mm -hmm. We did. We had somebody. Hmm. Uh -oh. We'll see if my classroom drive. voice oh, works. Yeah. You know, the day, Would this work if I use this one? You never have to fight the paper. No? Yeah. This, this, doesn't bit. It will. And I've got this doesn't my work either. They don't. Well, oh, they're not working at all. Okay. So I can, instead of going through my car, well, the the on that the I can go around. Enough. We got a guy? Yeah, isn't, um, nice. isn't the the um, corrections facility on the base? On the base, yes. Okay. So usually when I come to work, I just go through the uh, like the sandwich kind of up to the board of three. So that's because it's a lot easier for me to come out for three. It's a lot easier coming out for three. But during the summer, I can take the base all the way to exit two. So you can go by. Oh, I see. You can. Or you can. You want to get off the test? We got us further along than we were. So basically. I can't do that. Uh -huh. That's a higher level of security then. Oh, really? That's like an yeah. actual Air Force Base. Oh, because of the pay, pay pause. pause. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, I can't Somebody else is handing I something tried. out in the hallways. Yeah. Kevin, did you get a picture of the crowd? I'm surprised there was yeah. a Do you need a blurb? Because, yeah, that's what I get off at. I get off at exit one. Maybe not. Look around and I go all the way down the connector. Exactly. Fifteen minutes is not bad. Exactly.
Good evening, and thank you so much for being here tonight. Before we start, we have a couple of housekeeping items. The first is that the restrooms are right across the hall, if needed, out that door. Uh, there's a sheet to sign in if you'd like to be on our list of contacts so that we can remind you of other forums and the special town meeting. I'm also asking that all cell phones uh, be on mute and be put away during the forum. So please check those. I'd like to thank Born TV for live streaming uh, this forum on channel 15. It will also be available after tonight on borntv.com uh, on that website. We appreciate having Michael with us tonight with the TV studio. I also want to thank Mr. LaMarche, the superintendent of schools, and the Bourne Public Schools employees for their cooperation. We have, I've been told, the best forum ever put together in this state, with each panelist being an expert in his or her field. We are not here to give you both sides of the issue on the effects of marijuana. This forum is titled, The Adverse Impact of Commercial Marijuana on Public Health addiction and public safety. Representatives from marijuana businesses have had workshops in Bourne regarding recreational marijuana, giving what they call the positive side to retail marijuana. The adverse side on the issue has not been addressed, however, and that is the purpose of our forum tonight. I want to thank each of our very distinguished panelists for being here tonight. Thank you very much. Um, before we start, I'd like to recognize the members of the Born Opt Out group, and especially George Siever, the leader of the group and the one most responsible for putting this forum together. So if you'd like to be recognized, you can just raise your hand or stand up. If you don't want to be recognized, that's fine too. But um, those who have been working with George, we thank you. Uh, I want to recognize Don Hayward for his participation in this as well. He's not here tonight but he also helped, and all those who helped behind the scenes. I also want to recognize the members of the Born Cares Group, of which I am a member. Please raise your hands or stand if you'd like to be recognized if you're in the Born Cares Group. You don't have to, but mm -hmm. that's fine. These groups have worked separately for the most part, but our goal is the same, and that is to support a warrant article for the ban on recreational marijuana retail establishments at the special town meeting on Monday, October 1st. The article does not ban medical marijuana. We are concerned about what the normalization of recreational marijuana establishments will have on our community and especially on our youth. To make the best use of our time, we are using the card method. You may write a question on the card directed to individuals on the panel and also to the panel as a whole. Feel free to raise your hand if you need a card to write more questions as we proceed. When you are done, hold the card up and volunteers will pick it up for you. There will be no discussion, remarks, utterances, or rudeness from the audience. Those who are not displaying respect respectful behavior will be asked to leave. I shouldn't even have to say that. But at the end of the question and answer period, panelists will each have five minutes to make closing remarks. I'm going to give a brief introduction of each panelist so that we can start the questions and get as many questions answered as possible. I will wait till um, Michael O'Keefe comes to do his uh, bio. We have Tom Hostetter, MA, representing Sheriff James Cummings tonight. Thank you for being here. He has been on the heroin and opiate crime reduction clinician, or has been the heroin and opiate crime reduction clinician at the Barnstable County Sheriff's Office for the last two years. Prior to that, Tom was the lead clinician at High Point Inpatient Psychiatric Hospital for five years. He has worked for the last 26 years providing substance abuse and mental health counseling in a variety of settings. And I also just wanted to add, I had him on my TV show yesterday up front with Linda. So if you'd like to hear more from him, he did another half hour um, just with me. You can go to borntv.com and, and look up that um, segment that he, he did. It was great. Uh, Peter Bosco. 
thank you for coming. MD is a residency trained board certified emergency physician with over 18 years of post-residency clinical experience. He has graduated from Tufts Medical School in 1996, having lived and practiced in Massachusetts since 2000 at a variety of hospitals in southeastern Massachusetts. He has witnessed firsthand the growing epidemic of substance abuse in Massachusetts and has extensive personal clinical experience with this issue, including the negative effects of marijuana use and abuse. Dr. Amy Turncliffe, thank you for being here. She obtained a PhD in neurobiology from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, followed by postdoctoral training at Harvard Medical School. She began her professional career as an analyst specializing in pain and psychiatric conditions, including mental health uh, is mental illness and addiction. She continues to provide scientific education in these therapeutic areas as founder of Rock Fern Scientific Consulting, LLC. Over the past decade, she has dedicated a tremendous amount of time at the local, regional, and state level advocating for youth substance abuse prevention and behavioral health promotion. Patricia, thank you for being here. Patricia Maracostas is Director of the Organizational Advancement and Public Relations at Gosnold on Cape Cod. She was Director of Prevention at Gosnold from 2015 to 2017, and is also an instructor at Cape Cod Community College since 2015. Kevin Rosario, thank you for being here. Kevin is a nationally certified recovery coach family coach, and intervention professional, and has worked in the field since 2012. He is also very active in the community and shares openly that he is a person in long-term recovery and is passionate about using his experience to help others. Christine Greeley, thank you for being here. Thank you. Christine. Um, has an MA with LMHC mm -hmm. after her t uh, as part of her title, is a retired school administrator who for decades has also works, worked on substance abuse and mental health issues for youth through prevention and education. She is currently a Cape Cod Regional Technical High School School Committee member, chairman of the Yarmouth Substance Awareness Committee and member of the Barnstable County Regional Substance Abuse Committee. She was recently named a 2018 unsung heroine by the Mass Commission on the Status of Women for her work in addressing community-wide substance use prevention, education, and intervention needs. Thank you so much. And I do have a disclaimer that Amy would like to just read. Sorry, little housekeeping item. <clears throat> So I just need to read this up front. Uh, while I do volunteer my time with my local substance abuse prevention coalition, I'm not speaking tonight on behalf of or representing the views of the Decisions at Every Turn Coalition. The views I am presenting, as are, presenting are mine as a Massachusetts resident and mom of three based on my professional experience. Um, and in this capacity, I have been closely following Massachusetts marijuana policy over the past three years. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else have to? I would, I would state that I'm not here representing the Yarmouth Substance Awareness Committee. I'm here as an individual with a commitment okay. to the issue. Okay, uh, thank, you. thank you. I should also state that I'm not here representing any of the facilities I work for or the Sandwich Substance Abuse Prevention mm -hmm. Committee, which I'm also a member of. Yeah. I, on the other hand, am here to represent Gosnold. I'm also the <laughs> yeah. director of the Falmouth <laughs> Prevention Partnership and the uh, a founding member of the Regional Substance Abuse Council. So I think I speak for myself and Kevin Rosario that we are here representing Gosnold. Okay. You told everybody who I'm representing, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, you can't hear. Oh. oh. Okay. Okay. Maybe we can go to the podium even when we're or doing our five minutes. I could speak louder. I just didn't want to be. Okay. I, I didn't know what you could hear. I said that myself and Kevin Rosario are here representing uh, Gosnell tonight. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. So we do have some questions. If you want a card, uh, Tom will get you a card. If, if you want to write a question out, just raise your hand and he'll get you a card. 
I have some questions already. So after you've written the question, just raise your hand again and he'll come pick it up. So this first question. He's coming around. He's coming hmm. around. Okay, thank you. We'll try to do that. It's not so the first problem. question <laughs> is for Pat Maristostas. Metrocostas. Mm -hmm. er, That's okay. Okay. <laughs> um, it says, how much does it cost for treatment for addiction for one person? And how does that compare to the 3% tax being advocated? Shall I stand? I mean, Kevin. Kev sure, if you'd like I to just stand. So I can project. I, I can't speak to the uh, to the three percent um, revenue and what that will mean for Massachusetts, but Kevin can explain in uh, brief detail uh, what the actual cost of treatment is. So he, he he can certainly do that. I don't think I need to stand up. You guys can hear me in the back. <laughs> So it's hard to really put a cost on treatment because very rarely is it a single episode of treatment. But if you want something to gauge it by, um, we're a nonprofit treatment center and our detox is $575 a day. And our residential program for 28 days is $15,400. Average cost of a 30-day program minus insurance is usually between thirty dollars and $50,000. We're on the low end because we're a nonprofit. We're trying to kind of help the, you know, more people. So we brought costs down. Um, but that's assuming they come through once and never come back, which is not typical. Um, and that's, it's an ongoing chronic illness when you're dealing with substance use disorder. So it's typically ongoing therapy, ongoing support. So it's hard to really put a number on it, but those give you some vague ideas, I hope. Yes. If I could add to that, it's not just the cost of the treatment when you're in recovery going to a program. We see these people revolving through the emergency department on a regular basis, and the cost of each visit to the ER is probably upwards of $1,000, on top of which those people stay in the ER often for multiple days because there's a shortage of substance abuse beds for them. And because of that, everyone else has to wait longer to get the care they need. There's less beds to move people from the waiting room into the ER, and there's a hitting cost to the health of everyone else while you're trying to manage the substance abuse patient who usually takes a lot of resources. So it's not just the dollar cost of the rehab itself, but the ongoing cost of, to the whole system related to their care. Mm -hmm. Good point. Thank you. Did anyone else want to address that? Can I just wanted to address the 3% tax, <clears throat> if nobody else wants to address that. Um, I know I've heard that many times, but we can ha get the 3% tax and then we can use that for mm -hmm. treatment recovery. It's kind of this revolving cycle, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I want to remind everyone that that 3% tax projections are just projections. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, they are estimates that are being put out by the industry mm -hmm. um, to entice people and communities to enter into an agreement with them. So I would just say that those 3% tax projections are just projections, um, and there's no <laughs> promise that, that there will be anything left after um, the, the costs are accounted for, um, increases in costs mm -hmm. that have been estimated for states like Connecticut and Rhode Island who have done um, projections mm -hmm. and shown that the costs well out outpace the tax revenue. Mm -hmm. And I think it should be pointed out that 3% on a million dollars is $30,000. <laughs> rather small amount of return in taxes. And the cost of regulation in Colorado has far outweighed what they have been given in tax revenues. So that's something that, that folks should consider as well, the cost of regulation. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. This question is for Amy and Christine. From your experience, can you tell us of a connection between teenage use of marijuana and later personality problems? You do it. I, I was just going to say, I'm not a mental health clinician, so I'm a scientist um, and public health advocate. But I can, so I, I will answer and then I will let Chris and 
and maybe um, you could speak as well to this, um, just say that there, it is well, now well documented in the scientific literature, these are robust studies showing a link between um, youth or young adult cannabis use and especially now with the high THC cannabis that um, we're seeing and that comes with commercialization and mental health issues, whether that be um, psychosis, um, you know, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder. So there is a, a very considerable risk there, I think, and probably a, one that will be a growing risk over time with the increased potency of commercial products. Mayor Jaffe wants to turn first. It isn't my area of expertise to speak per se about the developing brain and marijuana use and abuse. However, I have seen lots of teenagers and young adults who have been abusing marijuana for years that suffer from <coughs> mood disorders yes. and cognitive issues, and there's a lot of literature out there. If I can point people to a resource that really speaks to this issue, there is a physician from Western Massachusetts named Dr. Ruth Pote, P-O-T-E-E. -E. <coughs> Go online, find some of her lectures on YouTube, and she has a wealth of studies and information that clearly demonstrate that marijuana alters the developing brain, creates addiction pathways, decreases cognition, <coughs> and has <coughs> it, they, it shows that it increases mental health problems and it, cognitive issues in the developing brain that last for the rest of a person's life. So that science is out there, and it's a fact. Go online, read it. I, it would take me hours to go into all the studies that are there. That's, I think, the thing that they've really been able to start to quantify. They've even through some CAT scan and other kinds of scanning found uh, some brain differences, and in particular in the earlier onset in uh, adolescent years, because they are saying that the impact of marijuana on the developing brain may last as late as to the age of 24 and that in testing that they have done, they have found a seven-point drop in IQ on habitual using uh, individuals in their teenage years, and seven points is half the standard deviation. It's not a good thing to have happening. And they do find, they, and they are looking at it more and more, the increase in the schizophrenia and some of the other paranoid features, things like that, <coughs> to the point where they're very, very concerned. And the other part they list is that they are looking or beginning to look at whether or not much as in alcohol, they were looking at genetic uh, characteristics uh, of alcoholism and multifamily uh, generational pieces. They're beginning to also wonder about some of that within the addiction, uh, the addiction uh, illnesses. Thank you. I'd like to add to that a little bit. Um, in the jail, I've interviewed over the last two and a half years about 750 inmates. I'm just going to give you some statistics that uh, I think might be a little bit startling. Um, Sixty percent of the inmates reported they had mental health problems. Fifty-eight percent reported that they were duly diagnosed. Mm -hmm. A dual diagnosis means they have a mental health problem and a substance abuse problem. Seventy percent of those who reported they were duly diagnosed, their first drug ever abused was cannabis. Right. The average age of first use, 14. Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> yep. So in other words, <laughs> people who say it isn't a gateway drug, I'm not sure that that argument holds water. <laughs> but one of the next questions says, do you consider marijuana a gateway drug that leads to abuse of other drugs? I think you should and that's take for that, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> I think Kevin should take yeah. that. <coughs> so I just got to say this before I, I feel like it's, it can be very, and I know that's the purpose of this, but personally, I don't really care what anyone does, what everyone chooses to do. Why I'm here and why I feel strongly about this and why I've been on like five or six of these panels is because I'm a person in long-term recovery. And with Patty, I do a lot of prevention work and I do a lot of talks in the schools. And when you talk to young people and if you look at like the pride surveys that reflect this as well, the perception of the risk of marijuana has dropped so dramatically over the last couple years. And the legalization of it was ridiculous. It was a really bad idea in the middle of an opioid epidemic where, you know, 150,000 people died in the last three years. Mm -hmm. And what that does is young people who are defiant, and as it is, they look at it as, well, how bad can it be if we've legalized it? 
and then people that used to be in the closet kind of smoke marijuana because it was illegal are now riding the lawnmower smoking a doobie like, hey, I got my cod now, it's legal, which sends the message to the young people that it's legal, you know? And so the legal thing has really kind of hurt the recovery community and hurt young people because, you know, alcohol is legal. It's been killing more people every year than any other drug. You know, Oxycontin's legal, morphine's legal. I mean, there's a lot of legal things that are not good for the body, but with, with marijuana specifically, young people have drastically, their perception of risk is really low. And so that means they're more likely to use it. And then the science, the neuroscience of addiction says that the underdeveloped brain their prefrontal lobe is not fully mm -hmm. developed, and this isn't just marijuana, by the way. Nicotine, these jewels mm -hmm. and these vapes, we don't want to get off topic, but anything mm -hmm. that you put up there that stimulates the brain, that releases dopamine, creates this like euphoric feeling that desensitizes normal functions and normal behaviors so that they become like really dependent on it. And so when you just put more marijuana in the system and you make it more accessible, I probably have the same point on more liquor stores and lowering the age and more cigarettes and more vapes, like anything that we're gonna do to put our young people at risk of putting any kind of chemical in their system that's gonna stimulate that brain and stunt growth of that brain puts them on that wrong path. And then just to, I won't keep you hostage, but to go to the other side of it, I think we can all agree on the young people. As a person in long-term recovery, uh, opiate dependent people, alcohol dependent people, they go into treatment, they accept treatment, but they really struggle with the idea that they can't smoke marijuana. That marijuana helps them with their anxiety. It helps them with their joint pain. And, and I have no issue with medical marijuana, and I don't want to get into that either at the moment. But my point is that people in recovery are really having a hard time staying in recovery as it is. Mm -hmm. And marijuana is one of those things that seems innocent enough. And every time we co-sign it and stamp it and cross another line, it just pushes them along that. And now they're smoking marijuana, which leads to a regression back to opiates, which can often lead to death. You know, so. I'm not an anti-anything guy. I'm a protect our youth guy and look out for my people in recovery guy. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say that, that was very well said. <laughs> <laughs> um, all I was going to say was that I think from a neuroscience perspective, the current thinking is that any addictive substance is a gateway. It's just right. a matter of what you start with. Right. So it could be nicotine, could be alcohol, could be marijuana, could be an opioid or something right. else. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think, you know, you touched on all the major points, which are, um, access and availability, reduction uh, in the perception of harm, and reduction in the perception of disapproval, uh, which all impact youth use. Mm -hmm. Well, and what's sad is that the, uh, the opiate crisis, for those of us in prevention where that's our focus, the opiate crisis has given rise to kids using other substances in ways that parents think are less harmful. Right. At least my son or daughter is only smoking marijuana. They're only drinking. They're not using heroin. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that piece has even made that more complicated, the prevention work more complex for us because as the kids' perception of harm has been reduced, so has the parents' perception. So it's, it's caused this snowball effect where it's made our job so much more difficult. Uh, Kevin can attest to the fact, and I can tell you, I can sit up here as someone who works in a treatment center and tell you that nobody in our treatment center who's there for heroin and opiate abuse started with a needle in their arm. Right. None of them. None right. of them. So do we think it's a gateway drug? Absolutely. Is it always? Do you always go on to something bigger, badder, whatever language we, you want to use? No. But is it, is, is it, can it be very likely? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. This one was for Tom and Mike, um, who's not here yet, and others if possible. And it's similar to the other one that I read. From your experience, can you tell us the relationship between teenage use of marijuana and later problems regarding criminal behavior? Sure can. 94% um, <laughs> of all the inmates in the Barnesville House of Corrections, 94% are there because of a drug or an alcohol addiction. That's straight across the board. That means 7% when I do their interview, I've never touched a thing. 94% are addicted. Currently, we have 51% of our population is heroin and opiate addicted. Over the course of two and a half years, it was actually 62% of the people I interviewed were heroin and opiate addicted. 74% of that 51%, 74% reported that they had a overdose requiring medical uh, treatment 
at least one or more times in their lifetime. An overdose where they were dying or, or close to death requiring medical treatment. 67% um, of those addicted to heroin and opiates, first drug of choice, first drug ever experimented with was cannabis. And 100% of those who report addiction to heroin and opiates report that they've also abused cannabis as well. Average age of first use across the board was 14, yeah. uh, 14 years of age. Um, so yes, there, there is a direct correlation. Um, when we look at criminal behavior, 54% of the inmates told me that their crime was drug related. That could be uh, selling drugs, it could be possession of drugs, it could be breaking and entering into someone's house to get money for drugs. 78% mm -hmm. reported that they were actually under the influence when they committed their crime. So there is a direct, a very strong correlation between substance okay. abuse, cannabis, and later criminal activity and addiction. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I can jump in on that as well and say, first I want to say is I don't think that people that smoke marijuana are criminals or bad people. Uh, it is a fact that some people at a young age smoke marijuana and never transition to anything else. So we're not I'm not attacking those people. The truth is that some people experiment and because of a lot of different reasons, underlying mental health, genetic predisposition, different other stress factors, they cross the line and it keeps accelerating out of control. The problem with that is by the time you identify that it's actually a problem, it's really hard to reverse it. So the really only way to guarantee someone doesn't become uh, addicted is to not start in the first place. But with that said, for me, as a young person, I started smoking marijuana at 13. You don't have to be a psychiatrist to know that I'm ADHD to the max, right? You can see, look at me, I'm bouncing <laughs> off. My, I had a half a cup of coffee at 6 a.m. <laughs> this is where I live. I live way up here in the red line. So when I found marijuana, it did temporarily calm my nerves and take the edge off. And I immediately started shoplifting because I was 14 and I didn't have a job, and my mom wouldn't give me that much money, so I used to go steal hats at like J.C. Penney and Silverstein's and stuff and sell them to kids in school, and that sent me down, I'm very open, like you can Google me, like I have a four page <laughs> quarry, you know, like mm -hmm. my early decisions of marijuana is not a big deal, led me to alcohol is not a big deal, led me to the pills are not a big deal, and my whole life ended up being becoming a big problem, and I had that very criminal mindset at a young age, like if I want it, I'm gonna go get it. So again, I don't feel like everybody goes down that road, but for me, when I started at a young age, it's like you gotta do what you gotta do to get it. And then when you get into the heavier drugs, you can, I've worked a full, I always had a job. I would work a full-time job and sell drugs and shoplift <laughs> and commit crimes just to try to keep up with it because it becomes such a ro roaring monster that you can't afford to feed the habit. Um, so <coughs> my experience says that I started shoplifting for marijuana, you know, uh, because I liked the way that it made me feel. It took the edge off for me. Um, but that just sent me down a road of self-medication and never learning good healthy ho coping skills and then building a tolerance. And when you try marijuana and, and someone says, don't do it, don't do it because you're too young, don't do it because I said so. And once a young person tries marijuana or smokes a cigarette or drinks a beer and nothing crazy happens, it gets to wondering what else is there out there. And it put me down this, this road where I was more willing to try things that I thought I would never try before because other things that they told me not to try, I enjoyed. You know, so <laughs> the likelihood of further experimentation in young people, you know, it grows because of, you know, different things like that. That was my experience anyway. Thank you. Oh, we got a guy. Oh, great. <laughs> 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 All those TV this is addressed to <laughs> Peter. It says, in your um, emergency room practice, do you see the emergencies of marijuana use, mm -hmm. uh, particularly the current stronger version in the synthetic marijuana? Yeah. The question was, in my clinical experience, do I see the negative effects of marijuana and especially synthetic marijuanas? I've seen, it's, it's been an interesting summer for me. Um, I work at Cape Cod Hospital mainly. And um, at the beginning of summer especially, I had a rash of elderly people coming in mm -hmm. after casually having edibles and then passing out, some of them injuring themselves in the process. So I do see the negative effects of marijuana in the emergency department on a routine basis. For a while there, we were seeing a lot of people having issues with the synthetic marijuana, but in the last year or two, I've been seeing less of that, but I've been seeing more people coming to the emergency department with the negative effects of smoking marijuana or 
taking marijuana edibles in the emergency department. I've had a couple of, of people come in having acute psychotic episodes. I've seen a ton of what we call um, hypercannabinoid emesis syndrome, mm -hmm. which is people who smoke regularly develop this problem where they vomit routinely and can't stop vomiting, but you tell them it's the marijuana, and the studies show it's the marijuana. This is a real clinical syndrome, but they do not want to stop smoking marijuana even when they've figured this out. Um, so the short answer is yes. I've seen a lot of people under the acute effects of marijuana in the emergency department. I've seen people marijuana intoxicated getting into car accidents or getting into fights, getting into traumas. It happens. It is not marijuana alters your mood, alt impairs your judgment and your reflexes, and it causes problems. It, it can make you lose your balance. It can drop your blood pressure, make you pass out. So yes, I have seen the effects of marijuana in the emergency department. One of the things I want to mention and that I had actually heard from an emergency room doctor had to do, and maybe you can elaborate on it, with alcohol poisoning, uh, in other words, drinking and doing marijuana at the same time, and that the normal body response it was what I was told to, mar to drinking too much alcohol might be to throw up or to get it out of your system, but if you've taken the marijuana with it, it suppresses that. And I have a couple of physician friends who've actually been practicing or seeing people who they've very, very concerned about with the dual use of, uh, of severe use of alcohol along with have high dose uh, marijuana. And I don't know if you've seen any of that or if there's any of that reported, but that's what they were telling me, which really concerned me. I haven't seen any studies or had mm -hmm. any clinical correlation where I can actually attest to that. It, it makes sense on, on some level. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's Cape Cod. We see a lot of alcohol related substance abuse issues as well. I think as a county, we have the highest per capita rate of alcohol abuse in the nation. Um, at least we did a few years ago. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we still hold that yeah. honor. <laughs> but um, <coughs> the, um, I, I can't attest to that being a common thing where what she's saying is because marijuana suppresses in most people the urge to vomit, you get more alcohol poisoning because you're less likely to vomit when you over drink. But I have seen people come in having had both marijuana and alcohol and falling and injuring themselves or getting into car accidents or other negative consequences from com combining those two substances. Okay. Thank you. I do have a question. I don't know if this is working now. I think it is. We're good. Okay. Um, you were talking about people coming into the emergency room and I was just reading not too long ago that um, when you, ha you eat an edible and it goes through your liver that it actually produces more THC and that's when you're more apt to get the psychotic episodes and the panic. You, have you seen that at all, uh, that you, you have more um, uh, people coming in with um, severe problems after they've had an edible? So here's the problem with edibles. If most edibles are homemade and the concentration of THC in an edible is very variable. In addition, the effects of an edible take two to four hours to really hit you. So people take an edible, and in Colorado, th there was this, a huge issue with this when they, they first came out. They would market these edible substances like cookies, and a cookie might be this big, the size of a half dollar. Mm -hmm. And one-fifth of that coffee, cookie was a serving of THC. And you get a a ba bag of these cookies. <laughs> so you eat one cookie, no one reads that, or no one realistically is going to eat a fifth of a cookie. So they eat a cookie, they don't get an effect. They eat another cookie. By the time it's starting to hit them, they've probably eaten the whole bag. And then what happens is, because of that delayed right. response, all of a sudden they have way too much THC in their system, and you get the more THC, the more negative consequences you have, the more likely you are to hallucinate, become psychotic, um, have all the negative consequences. So that's what happens. It's not that the liver actually will take the THC and somehow magnify it. It's that the delayed absorption right. of the THC is such that it will impact you very suddenly and very hard when it actually does hit your system. There's an arm raised in the back. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Never Thank mind. you very much. Um, here's another question. Is smoking pot on a daily basis less harmful than smoking regular cigarettes? 
<laughs> and does it affect the lungs in the same way? Compare smoking pot to regular cigarettes. So that's directed at, at me again? And that's to well, anyone. I, okay. <laughs> well, I'll start out. What happens the first time you smoke marijuana? You cough. Mm -hmm. That's not because marijuana is good for your lungs or your airways, okay? It is a chemical irritant. There's smoke, there's tar, there's some of the same substances that are in tobacco. The idea of burning a substance and inhaling it into your lungs is counterintuitive. <laughs> it is not healthy. Don't lie to yourself and say that somehow burning this substance is healthier than burning that substance. You're going to heat up a substance and inhale its smoke. There's going to be detrimental consequences. A lot of the harm in tobacco, and tobacco is a harmful substance, comes actually from the paper used to ignite it. The, the paper in, s in commercial cigarettes is treated with chemicals, many of which are carcinogenic. A lot of these commercial rolling papers are treated with the same chemicals for marijuana. Now, marijuana and tobacco in and of themselves are harmful, so it's hard for me to say that tobacco versus marijuana, one is safer than the other. I will say that tobacco has less mind-altering effects and is less of an intoxicant than marijuana. So in terms of mood and um, cognitive function, there's less of that impairment with tobacco, so you're more likely to have an alteration of mood or impairment and get into an accident or do something stupid after smoking a joint. In terms of the long-term consequences of nicotine versus marijuana, a lot of that has to do is the form you're smoking it in. Are you using treated papers? Is it natural? Like, you know, are you buying just the tobacco in a shop and smoking it like that? Or you're using a more commercial product? Because some of the carcinogenic effects of tobacco come from that. That being said, part of the problem with marijuana is because of the way it's classified by the federal government, it's very hard to study the negative impacts of that. Um, I'm not old enough to remember this, but in the 1930s to 1950s, doctors and tobacco companies were touting the health benefits of tobacco, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. You know, right now, they're doing the same thing with marijuana because there isn't enough clinical experience to say otherwise. But they're not pushing these substances because they want us to be healthy. They're pushing these substances because they want to make money. Ooh. And they're going to say whatever they have to to get you hooked on their product so they can make money. And you have to be honest with yourselves. We wouldn't be sitting here having this discussion if marijuana wasn't in some way addicting and mood altering. So people who are trying to tell you otherwise, they're interested in their own pocket, not in your health. Mm. Does anyone else want to address that? I was going to oh, say okay. that I saw several Technical studies point. recently out of Canada and actually out of California in which they were doing some testing on the actual content of marijuana in terms of its medical impact on lungs and that. And they were saying that they were finding ammonia and hydrogen cyanide levels 20 times that of tobacco uh, and for the inhaling purpose. And they were very, very concerned about what they were finding, particularly since the growth and manufacture of uh, marijuana at this point is quite unregulated and there's a lot of toxins and other things that are just occurring because of the growing process at this point. So there is some stuff that some people are beginning to try to study um, some of the differences of what's, what's in marijuana and what impact it might have on the lungs and things. Thank you. Um, how does smoking pot on a daily basis affect personality, school studies, sports performance, and overall general health? And that's for anyone who wants to. I'll chime in on that. <laughs> I'll give a whack too. <laughs> yeah, you can go first if and you Amy. want. Amy. Amy. <laughs> Who wants to start? Ladies first. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, again, I'm going to go back to the science because I really believe in science-informed policy um, and decision-making. And there is a considerable body and a growing body of science, and I think we touched on it briefly, showing negative impacts on um, mental health, on cognition, school um, success, um, and a variety of other metrics around um, success and, and things like that. Um, so I do believe from a scientific perspective that marijuana, and, and in particular, I just keep going back to the, inc the high THC products that are appealing to youth that come with commercialization. I mean, we're talking candies, cookies, sodas. I mean, I go on and on. The dabs that, you know, that are, can be vaped and things like that, um, oils. Um, 
uh, do bring considerable risk for you. Again, does that mean everyone who uses is going to have a negative consequence? Um, not necessarily, no. Um, but, and, and I would go back to the IQ study, I think mm -hmm. uh, Chris cited. Um, I've heard that described, and I think Ruth Pote describes it. If you have a, a high, you start with a high, because everyone always says the example, oh, but I knew this kid, and they were valedictorian of the class, and they smoked pot every day. Well, if you're starting with a really high IQ, <laughs> <laughs> that seven points is really not going to be a huge deal, yeah. right? But if you're starting with a marginal IQ to begin with, that's going to drop you down and, <coughs> and really probably impact your um, school success and, and things like that. So, you know, these are important factors um, to consider, and I want to give the opportunity to talk about some experiences that maybe <laughs> you've all seen. I mean, you just... I mean, think about what the classic cliche stereotype of a stonehead is, a pothead. They're not running around cleaning the house, saving the, the world. Like, you stone and you hit the couch and you eat cookies and you play video games. You know what I mean? Like, I can tell you from personal, and that's not everybody, right? But for me, when I started to smoke, and then the science behind it is it stimulated my brain. And, and, and so, like, I used to like to play video games. Now I got to smoke weed to play video games. I used to like to go to the mall and watch a movie, but now I got to smoke weed and, and go to the mall and watch a movie because I've been so overstimulated with dopamine from the use of, the, of marijuana that now I can't do anything without smoking marijuana. And then it becomes a, a, a mentally consuming thing, like I can't wait to get out of class to go smoke marijuana. Then, you know, middle of high school, I can't wait till the end of class. I'm sneaking out at lunch to smoke marijuana. So, I mean, personally for me and a lot of my friends, things that should be important for normal citizens become way less important. And what's more important is smoking weed and relaxing and chilling and just falling back. It, it for me, and it, it, every drug impacts people differently. Like, I'm hyperactive to the max. You give me a little bit of coke, it might chill me right out. You give me a little bit of opiates, I'm cutting the grass. And that has the exact opposite effect on a normal person. It's just the way my chemicals work inside my body. You know, for me, Marijuana took all motivation from me. My only motivation was to get more marijuana and to chill as much as possible and just, you know, so that, that's just my per personal experience. So regular yeah. marijuana use is associated with something called amotivational syndrome. Yeah. So it decreases motivation mm -hmm. and there you, <laughs> there was a, thank you for that example. Yeah. Um, and, and what you're referencing is when you take a substance that increases dopamine in the body uh, habitually, the body compensates and decreases the, n the uh, basal Reduction. level yeah. of, um, of dopamine. So you basically now have to take the drug to feel the normal. Right. So in the inmate population, 46% um, of the overall inmates that I interviewed um, had not graduated high school. And 53% uh, first drug of choice, cannabis, age 14. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, this is to all panels. Please discuss what you perceive to be the most effective youth substance abuse prevention program mm -hmm. or programs. I, I, can, I can take that one. Okay. I think the, the most effective um, prevention programs involve entire communities. It's not a school issue. It's not a parent issue. It's not a business issue. It's really these coalitions that start at the grassroots level that bring people together from all sectors, that bring all perspectives, that involve youth, that involve business owners, that involve parents, that involve the faith-based communities, using evidence-based models that have been tried and true and proven that work. And those models include what they call putting risk factors, reducing risk factors for youth and increasing protective factors. Protective factors can be as simple as having family dinners more family supervision, more community involvement, more opportunities in schools. Risk factors have to do with the norms that are in our community surrounding drug use, surrounding firearms, and surrounding some things that may seem very, very distant to us in the world we live in today. We live in a very anxiety-ridden world. Um, so how do we protect our children against some of those factors? And coming together in community coalitions like the Born Cares Coalition, the Coalition in Falmouth, in Yarmouth, those groups are making an impact and, the, and it's measured through uh, evidence-based surveys that show that kids are using less marijuana, they're drinking less, they're starting. We want to delay onset of use. We want to educate parents. We want to support families and schools and such. So it's really coming together 
as a community. I encourage everybody to join their local coalition. If you don't have one, start one. I mean, again, there's a great one here in Bourne, and really coming together is really what, what it's all about. Nobody single-handedly is going to solve this problem, whether it's law enforcement, whether it's treatment facilities, whether it's schools, whether it's the faith-based community. Seven years ago when I started doing this work in prevention, I said I was like a skunk at the lawn party. Nobody <laughs> invited us to speak. Nobody wanted to hear us. Schools, if we were in schools, we, we were invited so infrequently, and if we were, it was looked upon as that school had some pox on it. Why do they need prevention programs? They must have a drug problem. You know, why do those parents need to be spoken to? Their kids must be using. Not the case anymore. Kevin and I joke about the fact that we could be out seven nights a week now. Our dance cards are full, sadly. I mean, I want to go back to the days where because prevention starts so early that we stop the bleeding on the other end of this crisis. And that's the only way it's going to happen. We can keep throwing more beds at treatment. We can keep building more jails. We can keep doing all that. But until we get on the other end of the continuum, and that's with primary prevention, that's with don't start to begin with because doors open that can't be closed. And it's great role modeling, and it's mentoring, and it's getting together as a community and saying, how do we solve this problem as a community? How do we stop blaming, and how do we get together and do that? And so that's really, I mean, again, coming from a place of prevention, I get really passionate about <laughs> it. So I, Thank you. I do too, but <laughs> so can I just add one thing? So, so I absolutely agree 100%. Part of that is something called environmental strategies. Yes. Environmental yeah. strategies are policies mm -hmm. that uh, prioritize primary prevention and public health. Mm -hmm. And environmental strategies or, or science-informed policies that prioritize primary prevention, they reduce access and availability mm -hmm. to substances, mm -hmm. they increase the perception of harm, and they increase the perception of disapproval and make the kind of I want to say denormalize substance mm -hmm. use, as mm -hmm. we were talking early on. So, I, I think there's an issue of peer pressure, and we often think of peer pressure as it being with our kids suffering. I think there's parental peer pressure too, in terms of you know you're not a cool parent, you're not doing that. A lot of it has started because there's been a lot of discussion about the social hosting laws that went into place because parents thought, well, it was okay to kids let kids drink if they're doing it at home. You know, that it'll be safe or it'll be under my control. No, it's illegal. They're under 21. You can get in serious trouble. The same thing exists for marijuana and other kinds of things. But the problem is that I think that these coalitions and the people who are working together really need to help. It's not just the message with the kids in school and all, but the message to parents, too that you need to be a parent and you need to be strong and you need to resist the, the ideas and the concepts that it's not cool to say no or it's not okay to do this or that. And I think that, um, I think that that's what we have to do is really work as a community on strengthening everybody's ability to work together and to support each other with the messages, whether it's messages to kids, to parents, to our neighbors, to our friends. Sir. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, this one, this one says, would you agree that having marijuana tested and regulated for adults to ensure safe access is better than uh, them finding it on the black market? <laughs> I say getting stabbed is way better than getting shot, but I don't want to get stabbed. <laughs> <laughs> you argue that point, but it's a different discussion. <laughs> <laughs> no, the people use that argument all the time, like, isn't mm -hmm. this better? Th so we're levying bad things. It's less bad. You know, just it's the same idea as my kid's only smoking weed, but he's smoking weed. He's only mm -hmm. drinking. He's, sm he's drinking, you know. So, yeah, if, like, the world's going to get taken over by madness, let's control the madness. But can we yeah. try to not let the world get taken over by madness? So, sorry, I wasn't meaning to be rude or cocky, <laughs> but that's kind of where my brain goes when, whenever someone poses a question, wouldn't it be? Yeah. It's yeah. the moral relativism of, of it all, isn't it, really? I mean, it's, yeah. oh, it's less than. It's not as bad as. And I think that's what got us to legalize marijuana. The right. opiate crisis was used to legalize marijuana. Well, it's not as bad as opiates. It's not as bad as heroin. Oh, you can't die from it. Though some of us would argue yeah. against yeah. that, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's just, it's an interesting uh, concept. It's, it's just, yeah, for, the I, mean, other, I think The other us, part of it is, too, is that there was some evidence and some studies coming out of Colorado that even with the legalization that their black markets were actually growing through that. 
And so it's not a clean kind of thing uh, to have, you know, going on. And I think that's, you know, significantly important, too, in this discussion. Basically, basically it becomes a supply and demand issue. Yep. If you legalize marijuana, okay, everyone's talking about all the revenue we're going to make from <laughs> marijuana, and that's, we're going to get that from taxing it. Well, guess what? Someone's going to come along and try to sell it to you cheaper without the tax that's on the black market because, you know, why, why should you have to give the man, the government, your tax dollars? And all you have to do is look at cigarettes. Um, there's a black market for cigarettes, and cigarettes are perfectly legal, but they're taxed up the wazoo, so there are people out there who sell them on the black market to try and undercut that. You don't think the same thing's going to happen with marijuana? I mean, you're wrong. That's right. Some people even think that, that these moves with, you know, Colorado and Mass and other states have actually what perpetuated the fentanyl increase in fentanyl in the market because the, the Mexican cartels have to diversify their portfolio. We've, we've gotten to their pocket by taking away some of the marijuana revenue by, you know, making it more accessible. So they're like, oh, yeah, no, no problem. We got this synthetic thing that we can sell, too. And they first, you know, slowly introduced it, and now it's being sold as a primary drug. Um, there's no science or facts. Or I'm just a guy that talks to a lot of people, a lot of police, too. <laughs> and... Um, it's a business. It's a multi-billion right. dollar business. And I'm not a, I understand business. I'm not mad at anyone trying to make a business, but all the dreams that they sell you are not reality. Like, you make it legal, you screen it, you package it, you can make it all beautiful. That doesn't stop someone else from coming underneath and selling it. Like, it's just going to increase access. And then if you look at Colorado, they had like a 300% increase in crisis calls. They doubled their homeless population, the transient population. They couldn't even deal with it. So then the social costs that become attributed with, you know, people being flocked to your town, your region, your state because of this, like, you know, at the end of the day, like, just fall back. You're a 30 year old person, 40, 50, you want to smoke a joint, mind your own business, good for you. Like, go do your thing. It's, Ill, it's legal now. It's been decriminalized. Like, people are so selfish, they gotta, like, take it to the next level. You know, it's like, uh, um, I don't know, it's frustrating because I personally have lost hundreds of friends dead, okay? Not bad people, not junky, good kids from good families. And I see the people, I see the demographic in here, I guarantee at least one grandparent is raising a grandchild in here because their loved one has issues. And if you're not, I know you know someone that is. So I get worked up and I get frustrated, not because I really am against marijuana. Like, do what you got to do, like, but don't impose it on the rest of us. Don't put a, all of our young people at risk. And then the proponents are going to say, well, there's, a, there's an age, and we're not targeting that young people. Okay, but you got strawberry gummy bears. You know what I'm saying? Like, come on. I, and it, you can make all the laws and all the restrictions that you want to try to justify and tell the community that you're, you're concerned about the youth. But the truth is, if there's more liquor stores, there's more liquor in the neighborhood. If there's more marijuana, there's more marijuana in the neighborhood. And it's, you know, that's the only thing, you know, you can't argue, supplying them in. The more, the more of it there is, the more access that you'll get. And not everybody's like a member, uh, like a citizen, honorable, card-holding, responsible person. There's going to be some guy that for a small fee will get a, guy, a young guy like me that says, hey, I'll buy you an ounce if you buy me an ounce. Done. And I can get it right on Main Street now. Perfect. You know, so I don't know. I just I feel like it's just a real bad time to be playing this game. Uh, we're desperately fighting and trying to, you know, one, save a whole generation that's dying, two, create initiatives to get in front of young people so that it's not cool to smoke weed, so that it's not cool to do drugs. It took, what, 10, 15 years for the Marlboro man to come back out and not be sexy anymore and have a hole in his throat. Now young people, if you ask them, cigarettes are, are nasty, they're dirty, they're not appealing because we didn't make it sexy anymore. We got honest about it. Now we're finally getting honest about Oxycontin. Oh, by the way, I guess it is habit forming and now hundreds of thousands of people are dying. Let's, let's cut that back. But you have people that are already opiate addicted, so now they're buying fentanyl and, and heroin off the market. So marijuana, it's not as bad. Okay, so it's not as bad. 15 years from now, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like a, it's just an effect that is scary as a person in recovery, as a person who has nieces and young, you know, all my, I'm have God children. And, and again, some people are going to smoke weed and never have a problem, be good humans and go to football practice. And like, and I, I don't think, I think there's, I know, I personally know good people that use marijuana. This isn't like a, against them. My only reason why I'm here at eight o'clock on a <laughs> Wednesday night <laughs> is because I, I do believe that we're messing with our young people and we're messing with our recovery community that's really already having a hard time 
to, you know, they, they, because of the compromised brain function, they have low impulse control. They don't do really well with reasoning and common sense and thinking things through. So when it's in front of them, they sometimes literally don't have the ability to say no, you know, and. Thank I you very much. Yeah, sorry, I get Thank a little crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question that's um, <laughs> directed, I guess, to Tom. It says, what programs are used in the jail for addicts to get them clean and motivated to stay off drugs? Wow, that's a big question. We have a lot of programs at the Barnesville County House of Correction. Um, first and foremost, every inmate walking in on the sentence side is assessed and evaluated. Um, once that's done, every unit, every group, wherever they find themselves on the sentence side, we offer substance abuse treatment, relapse prevention therapies, AANA, cognitive behavioral therapy. We had the entire RSAT program, which is called the shock program, which is an entire unit a six-month inpatient treatment unit for the inmates, um, known as a residential substance abuse treatment program. From there, we also have on the pre-sentence side, and this is new to the state of Massachusetts, pre-sentence means that they're sitting in jail on a bail, or they're being held without bail, and they could be sitting there three, four, five, six months. Um, and for the last almost two years now, we've had a pre-sentence treatment program. It's a 90-day program, um, and we've put close to 150 people through that program already. Um, in addition to that, um, we offer Vivitrol as, as a form of our treatment. Um, Vivitrol is a medication that is given once a month. Uh, it takes away the cravings uh, to get high to begin with. It also takes away the craving, uh, also takes away the ability to get high when you shoot uh, heroin or take opiates. Um, and then on top of all of that, we also offer aftercare programs in the community. Um, Wednesday nights, six o'clock, uh, we have a program in Falmouth that I conduct that I had to miss tonight, and one's in Hyannis as well at 6 o'clock. So we're also in the community. And most recently, we brought in a, another organization to help us called Project Roar, um, and now we're going to have recovery coaches in the community working with released inmates to help them remain clean and sober. So we're really taking a very proactive uh, stance to keep our inmates sober. Every sentenced inmate will also go through a reentry process. The reentry phase occurs about two to three months before they get ready to leave. We're going to meet with each person, figure out where you're living, how you're going to get there. Do you need a sober house, halfway house? Do you need a referral? We have a very robust referral program right now where people are sent to sober houses and halfway houses in communities, and if they can't afford it, we find a way to get funding for their first week or two so that they can stay clean and sober. So we are really doing a lot of work right now to keep our, our um, inmates on the right path when they get out. Thank you very much. Um, there was a, um, a card here, a question here too about uh, there are tests for people who are driving under the influence of alcohol, but how, w what kind of a test is there if you're using marijuana? There isn't, there currently isn't one. There isn't one. There is not one. The police departments do not have any standardized testing for that as of yet. I think there is no test currently to test somebody. They can just. They assess behavior. It's, it's, uh, if the DA were here, he could address how difficult mm -hmm. that is um, to prosecute because there, are, there, are, there is not a breathalyzer. There's, there are not standardized tests, so to speak, field sobriety as we know it with right. alcohol. So it's very, very difficult to prosecute. Um, oftentimes in fatal accidents, um, afterwards with an autopsy and with blood mm -hmm. testing, uh, a very high percentages of the, of those accidents, they right. find that there is THC in the blood. Yeah. Doesn't it go into the fat cell? Excuse me. There'll be no questions from the audience. Okay. I mean, that would be the <laughs> doctor. Mm -hmm. Okay. One one of the problems with THC regarding acute intoxication is, as stated, THC is fat soluble and it stays in the body for a very long time, and you can test positive for marijuana in excess of 30 days after smoking. Uh, marijuana if you have enough of it. So it is hard to have a serum level and determine a correlation between acute intoxication. Um, what the police rely on more than anything, because there are so many other substances, not just marijuana, that can intoxicate and impair somebody, including a lot of prescribed substances, and I'm not even just talking opiates. A lot of psychogenic mm -hmm. medications will do it too. So what police have to rely on more and more, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is field sobriety tests where they put you through a battery of coordination and cognitive tests there in the field to determine 
if you are indeed intoxicated, whatever the cause. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure we'll ever have the right test for a serum marijuana level, but I'm, I'm not mm -hmm. a scientist in that way. I, I couldn't say for certain. Ma maybe you know us, you know? Yeah, I, th I, I mean, There's you've all said one. it. It's extremely, yeah. extremely mm -hmm. difficult, and what's impair and causes impairment for one person may not cause impairment for another, depending on um, kind of body fat and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, what they are using is drug recognition experts, or what they're going to try to use is drug recognition experts. But uh, as of right now, I think everyone's unsure about how that's going to, to hold up. That's right. I've often said jokingly, if you find a manufacturer coming up with a reliable one, invest in the stock. <laughs> You're going to have a fortune on your hands. Really? They're looking for it desperately. There's no way right now. Okay, here's another one. What conflicts do you see, uh, foresee between state and federal law enforcement since federal law still considers possession, sale and of marijuana a felony? Who would like to handle that one? Well, I can tell you from the purchasing perspective, I, I sent a friend on a mission when they were in Colorado and to be clear, these uh, dispensaries only take cash. They That's can't right. take credit, credit cards, cards because you're not allowed to process, it's still a federal crime. So credit card, debit cards cannot be used. It's all cash. Um, so again, imagine the, the corruption on, on that level. Um, I can't speak to the other aspects of it, but that part I find very, very interesting, that it's a, it's, it's a cash business. I, I, mm -hmm. I think I need not say more on that end of it, but perhaps the DA can address that <laughs> question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Hi you there. for coming. <laughs> Um, we finally have Michael O'Keefe, our district attorney, joining us. So thank you very much for being here. I know you were in Boston and you had a long trip. Yes, I did. Down here, so mm -hmm. thank you for sure. for showing up. And we just started without you, if that was the case. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we've just been uh, answering some of the questions from the audience, and. Um, uh, why don't I just have you make a statement first since you've missed um, okay. you know, some of the questions. Like, like what you see at, at the county level or in mm -hmm. your position as some of the main problems um, using uh, the, um, you know, the recreational use of marijuana. And he could use the microphone. Sure. Do you want me to come you up there? You could just yeah, speak from Give him the, the, the mic. Give him the mic. No, the one you're holding. Oh, this one. Okay. <laughs> 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 I don't know if it works very well, but. <coughs> earlier question about the difficulty of prosecuting. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. I'm sorry I'm late. I've mm. been in the car for three and a half hours mm. from Boston. Mm. Now it's really amazing, you know. <laughs> you, but the state police tell me there was a terrible accident around Duxbury that oh. somebody may have lost their life in. Mm. It's too bad. So, um, you know, we're thinking about that person, obviously, but. Let me just talk to you about three aspects of this issue um, and why I think it's the, the increased availability of this stuff is. They can't hear you. Can yet. you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll try to do a little better. <laughs> and there are three aspects of this that I think are very harmful to both the public health mm -hmm. and the public safety of our communities. And let's start with some basics. The medical and scientific community tells us that the active ingredient in marijuana, which is THC, is four to 20 times higher than the marijuana of the 60s that I smoked. And I'm sure as many of you in the audience may have. <coughs> and and I, just parenthetically, when I was in college in the 60s, uh, you know, m we were still drinking pretty much Budweiser at Boston College. Mm -hmm. But I had a lot of friends who went out to UMass and Amherst, and that was much more of a drug culture than our beer drinking culture, if you will, at, at BC. But um, the stuff that was, you know, y available for people who wanted to smoke dope was the stuff that was grown in, you know, the southwestern part of the United States or in Mexico, and it had a THC content of, a, of about 2.5 percent. And if you look historically at the law in Massachusetts, it defines 
marijuana as a substance that has 2.5% THC because that's what it was then. Now, of course, it's like the seedless grape. It's hydroponically grown. It's, mm -hmm. you know, um, different strains put together. And the THC content is phenomenal in marijuana today. Uh, so it's four times up to 20 times greater than that 2.5% of the old days. And when one makes an edible out of it, you, dis you distill, I'll use that sort of word, the THC down and those edible products then can be up to have a concentration of THC of 70, 80, 90 percent. Mm -hmm. That's what you, you know, see people uh, overdosing on, going to hospitals for, and these other states where these uh, items are much more prevalent than they have yet to become here, although they're coming. They're on the way. We've legalized it. Current data estimate that 30.5 percent of current users of marijuana have a cannabis use disorder. Demand for marijuana addiction treatment is increasing globally. Marijuana is associated with poor grades and higher dropout rates. The younger that marijuana is used, the higher the rates of addiction to marijuana and other drugs, including opioids. The data goes on and on, and this data that I'm giving you is compiled by Dr. Bertha K. Madras of the Department of Psychiatry at, at uh, Harvard Medical School. Bertha was uh, the uh, chief of the White House Office of Drug Control Policy during the eight years of President uh, Bush. When uh, that eight-year stint at the Office of White House Drug Control Policy finished, Bertha came back to Harvard Medical School where she is now. So with that as a backdrop, let's consider the three areas that I'm the most concerned about. In, and their increased pot use among 12 to 17-year-olds, illegal growers and the black market, and a recent AAA study regarding fatalities associated with THC intoxication, and why knowing the data would tend to argue against bringing this to your community. Now, the increased use by kids. The Office of National Drug Control Policy tells us that current marijuana use for Colorado youth, ages 12 to 17, has increased 20 percent since recreational marijuana use was passed, um, while marijuana use nationally in those states that don't have recreational marijuana has decreased by 4 percent. Colorado ranks number one in the nation for marijuana use among 12 to 17-year-olds. Is this something that you want in your community? That's what you have to decide. This idea that the black market will disappear with legalized marijuana is a myth. The black market will flourish with <coughs> legalized marijuana, as it has done in every other place, be it Washington or Colorado or pick whatever other state. The black market doesn't disappear because you legalize marijuana. You just simply target, if you will, the customer who can't buy the marijuana and acquire it when it's legal recreationally. Kids can't. So they're going to become the market for the black market. Um, the, Polo, the Pueblo Colorado Sheriff and the DEA say that <coughs> Uh, these, there are large-scale grows by Cuban nationals who have moved from Florida and bought houses in any depressed housing market in Colorado they can find. And the Pueblo Colorado Sheriff and the DE say that these Cuban cartel members take over the homes, turn them into greenhouses, 
and are growing hundreds and hundreds of plants in each house and transporting it out of state to the marijuana markets nationally and internationally. And there have been any number of arrests of these large-scale grow operations in these states where they have legalized growing because it's like trying to hide in plain sight. The criminals are taking advantage of that. And, um, you know, again, you have to decide if you want that in your community. Michael, did you, I'm, I'm just going to um, go on with the questions a little sure. bit. Sure. So um, Do you want your microphone back? Yes, if that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll let you have go. like five minutes at the end as well. There were, but she cut me off from the last <laughs> one. Maybe she, uh, yeah, maybe she finished the last I, one. <laughs> it, 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 yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Okay. I'm you sorry. I didn't want I wanted to you to have five something minutes at the early. end, too. Sure. We have your five minutes. So, mm -hmm. so driving while high on THC is the third of the three points. In Massachusetts, driving under the influence of drugs is just as illegal and always has been as driving under the influence of alcohol. But in more than 30 years as a prosecutor, I have seen very few cases prosecuted either in my jurisdiction or anywhere in the state because there is no readily available means for police to detect and marshal evidence of THC impacting the ability to drive. Where it does show up is on the autopsy table. Mm -hmm. The Automobile Association of America has released a study that reports one in six drivers involved in a fatal crash in Washington, another state which has recreational marijuana, in 2014 had recently used the drug. So one in six dead people in motor vehicle fatalities was high on marijuana. The, this report analyzing vehicular accident in Washington found that the number of fatal crashes involving drivers who recently uh, used marijuana doubled after the state legalized the drug in 2012 is when Washington legalized it. Uh, do we want this in Massachusetts and in our communities? The, these are the, the sort of unintended consequences and the questions that you have to uh, ask before you, you know, decide, well, this is a good idea. We'll be able to, as a town, you know, realize some tax benefit to having these pot shops and all the rest of it. If that's the only way that you can think of to get revenue, um, that's a sad state of affairs. So um, those are the three points that I would make to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now I'll just go on with some more questions, if that's okay with everyone. Um, if if it is too late for you, uh, just feel free to leave quietly. But as long as you're interested, we'll keep going. The next question is, how would you describe the current situation regarding marijuana in our community? And that's open to you all. I see it every day. <coughs> yeah. In the emergency department, it's uh, mar marijuana has essentially been decriminalized. Everyone's about open about it. I see teenagers in the ER with their parents who openly admit to smoking marijuana and the parents basically have passively consented to it. Um, we have a lot of kids with psychiatric issues, teenagers. Um, a lot of them smoke marijuana. A lot of adults smoke marijuana. I've seen a growing number of elderly people experimenting with marijuana. It's, it's basically, we, by Making it legal, first medically and then recreationally, we've essentially told all aspects of society, hey, it's okay to smoke, this is safe, this is okay. And by legalizing it, we've created this problem. Thank you. In my experiences with school districts, they're seeing increasing numbers of students 
who are um, involved with it and are, are being told as an excuse, uh, the school administrators, that it's okay, my parents smoke pot at home, or I'm smoking my parents' pot. Um, I've heard actually a case uh, recently uh, in a community where uh, another student was reporting the parents were giving uh, the child marijuana for their 16th birthday. Um, I personally, in my own experiences, um, I resent, tell you the truth, to be in the subway station in Boston or to be walking along the main street in Hyannis and have the smell of marijuana smoke encompass me, uh, you know, and I, I re it really bothers me. I mean, it's one thing to do it privately in your home, which is what the law intended, but the public spaces that are being intruded upon with it are intruding on people who don't necessarily share uh, the same enjoyment. <laughs> That's right. But, but not only that, but it contributes to the normalization mm -hmm. That's right. of use for youth. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I can say at Watch at Mountain, same thing um, after legalization. So it's, you know, again, contributes to youth. youth. Yep. Good luck getting into a concert without smelling it. I was at a concert recently last weekend uh, with my wife, my daughters, and a guy next to me has a blunt. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's smoking it, and it, 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 it was quite offensive. And he offered it to me, and I yep. told him, I said, "Well, um, I, I work in law enforcement. I don't know if, if that'd be the best idea." And he was quite shocked by that. Um, mm -hmm. He was almost offended that I was there. So yep. it was uh, it was quite an experience. And they're my kids, you know, just getting mm -hmm. smothered, and, and it was awful. It ru it really ruined our experience. We left. Mm -hmm. I did have to ask him. I said. We're taking Uber home. How are you guys getting home? Oh, no, we, we brought cars. We're driving. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. This one says, can you speak more about self-medication and the stigma of mental health and prevention? I, you know, we, we hear a lot in our business, and Kevin can speak to this, and certainly the other clinicians on the panel, mm -hmm. that we hear particularly coming from young people, as Kevin alluded to, that uh, marijuana and or alcohol makes them feel better, makes them fit in, lessens their anxiety, helps with their depression. And the old expression, you know, it, it, it works until it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And I think the messaging that we have to give to young people is how do we put, give them tools so that they don't self-medicate? How do we teach, you know, healthy mind, body, spirit early in kindergarten, not when they're using in high school, in middle school, and starting at 12. So I think it's that the messaging is so important, coming from parents, from school, from the community. And again, I think the clinicians can talk about that a little bit more, but that's, that's it's pretty my much. Question, but my question is. Excuse me, you, you'll have to write it on a piece of paper. I'm sorry. So we'll get you a card. You can write it. Okay. <laughs> All right. So if I let you speak, I'm going to have to let other people speak. So we just said, you know, speaking, just write it out on the card. Thank you. I, I find the concept of self-medication interesting. We have a very powerful pharmaceutical industry in this country and worldwide. And we have been conditioned to believe mm -hmm. we need to take a substance in order to feel better. Right. Um, look at, you know, Prozac is the poster child of it. I, I was a teenager when Prozac became, I think it was the man of the year on time. And it was mm -hmm. touted as this wonder drug that's going to cure depression and mental illness. And even before that, we had this concept that there's a pill for everything. My parents were Italian immigrants. And you know, you don't feel well, take this, take that. Um, and the idea that we need to take a substance in order to feel better, to feel normal, is the problem. It's right. why all these substances exist. <coughs> Self-medication is not the answer. It never has been. It's an easy out, but long term it, it will not help it. It will make your problems worse. And the real answer is to find coping mechanisms or to recognize the way your mind and your personality works to identify what's the right path for you. And unfortunately, we've become a, a very cookie cutter society where everyone has to fit into these neat little boxes. We sit our children in schools for eight hours a day where they're forced to sit like perfect mm -hmm. little angels. And if you can't, if you don't, then you have ADD and you need a mm -hmm. pill. Mm -hmm. And that's not right. the, the answer. The answer is to change the way we see these things. Not to, oh, you're not fitting into our box. Here's a pill to make you fit. We have to change the box or create multiple boxes because we don't all think and act 
and work the same way. And it's wrong to think that we should and that we need a medication in order to do that. I, I'd like to, you know, comment on what the doctor said. One of the things that I support in schools all over the Cape is a, a, a program called Commerce Choice. And it, it, you know, it's in a lot of schools in the Cape now. And it, it is trying uh, to teach kids a, as the doctor alluded to, a coping mechanism um, to calm themselves. You know, one of the things is we fought back in 2008 against decriminalization of marijuana, then in 2012 against medical marijuana, now most recently the recreational marijuana. Um, I, I listened to a lot of doctors over the years in this fight. And one of the things that was striking to me is a young doctor from uh, Harvard Med School came down and had worked in addiction for a long time. And one of the things that he said was that in back when I was a kid, people developed anxiety and depression at about puberty and then the depression that followed the anxiety from puberty was at about 17 or 18. Right. Today, kids at 10, 11, and 12 yeah, are anxiety. developing anxiety and then getting depressed that, out, that, that naturally follows the anxiety. And if somebody behind the middle school says, come in, I got a beer or a joint, come into the woods, that's the beginning of the kid thinking. And he takes that artificial substance, be it a drink or a, a joint, and he feels better. He feels more relaxed. You know, that's the beginning of the self-medication for that kid for a long time to come in his future. And that's why Commer Choice is almost a, uh, you know, it's a mindfulness program that, you know, teaches breathing and s relax. and. And I know that the teachers who have little Johnny, who was a pain in the ass in the classroom, after going through this program, Johnny's behavior changed. And if a school teacher says that, I'm impressed by that. And I think that's a good program, and that's why I've supported it. Is that in the born schools at all? Yeah. Commer yeah. Choice? Mm -hmm. Good. And that's just one coping mechanism. But that, as the doctor says, is what has to be the substitute for these substances, be it alcohol or marijuana or whatever. And, you know, we've got to, but what have we done as adults? We've sent the kids the exact opposite message. Marijuana is okay. And we've even said to them, it's a medicine. So what do you think kids are going to do? Thank you. Uh, another question, what are the major differences between medical marijuana dispensaries and marijuana adult use establishments? And you may also want to include what's the difference between medical marijuana and recreational marijuana. So who would like to go first? And I don't know if that's my area of expertise to talk about the difference. Did you ask what's the difference between medical and recreational uh, dispensaries? Right. right. <laughs> I don't know if you want me to, I mean, I can't answer this, but um, essentially they sell the same products. So I can tell you that in Massachusetts, the way the system will be set up is the Cannabis Control Commission is going to be taking over from the Department of Public Health the medical marijuana program. They're working on that transition. And they are going to virtually separate them within the shop. So, but the products will be the same and it's a matter of whether someone has a medical card or they do not have a medical card. Does insurance actually pay for medical marijuana? No. Okay. Insurance, insurance so, is so, not paid. So, let me speak as a doctor that... Sure. And again, part of the problem is that the way marijuana is classified on the federal level, it's near impossible to do actually do clinical trials. But speaking mm -hmm. as a physician, I can tell you, I know of no definite approved indication for marijuana as a medical substance. Right. Does it help some people with anxiety or mood disorders? Yes, I, I, I know somebody who smokes a, 
marijuana twice a day and it regulates his mood and apparently it works for him. He's a very high functioning individual. So, I mean, I, I can't say that there isn't some possible benefit to some people. But as a physician, I can say that I don't know of any definite indication where there's a clinical trial that marijuana is proved to consistently and effectively treat a certain condition where I can say I can pre prescribe this reliably and know that it is going to help you with this condition. Medical marijuana has basically become the back door for legalization of marijuana and for societal acceptance of an addictive and abusable substance, mm -hmm. basically. I, I read that the medical marijuana, uh, does it has the CBDs in that's it, right. but that's what the I, just I wanted to touch I was, on. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. Okay. yeah. What so, what, so what I wanted to touch on was <coughs> I actually do not like the term marijuana. I do not like the term cannabis because mm -hmm. What's happened now with commercialization, whether it be medical or recreational, is that more often we're seeing um, the extraction of the components, and there are many, many, many chemical components, na naturally occurring chemical components, in the marijuana plant or in the, the cannabis plant. So the two that are most often talked right. about are CBD, which is cannab cannabidiol, and THC, which is delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol. Um, the portion that gets you high is THC and while there are m possibly some conditions in which um, THC is beneficial, for example, um, uh, uh, chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting where there, there is an FDA approved medication, cannabis based medication for that, um, um, most often it's CBD that may ha uh, that people talk about when they talk about medical utility. CBD is non-psychoactive, it is non-addictive right. from what we know right now, um, and um, it is thought to have maybe some anti-inflammatory properties and is mm. actually thought to reduce some of the potentially harmful effects of THC. Right. But as uh, the DA was talking about with you know, current marijuana, current THC products, you're seeing very high THC. Right. And actually what's happened at the same time is CBD has decreased because they're breeding plants and making products for the greatest high. And unfortunately, that again brings greater risk as you uh, increase THC and reduce CBD, then you are um, eliminating the capacity for CBD to mitigate some of the harmful effects of THC. So, you know, for things like PTSD, I've, which I've heard that, mm -hmm. that um, I had a, a gentleman come and say, well, you know, I have patients who have PTSD and they need high THC. There's actually literature that shows that, that mm -hmm. THC mm -hmm. worsens yeah, PTSD right. um, yeah. in the long term. So the individuals <coughs> who are making recommendations, they're considered, they're called bud tenders, um, they're not physicians. They are not medical professionals. Right. And unfortunately, they are making recommendations, such as in Colorado, we heard about 70% recommend THC for pregnant women. Really? Not a good idea. Um, so, so I think that, that brings up a whole other um, issue. Now, a CBD product was just approved by the FDA for seizure disorder, for severe seizure okay. disorder. So these cannabis-based, you know, the chemical component medications will be coming down the pi pipeline, and I believe that medication was prioritized by the FDA. But I think while there may be some medical utility from some of the chemical components, the way in which this is being done right now is not safe and not healthy. So I have another question that's related to that. It says, do you foresee the FDA taking action against vendors who sell marijuana products as medicine, though they have not been approved? The FDA has said that they are going to take action uh, against vendors who are making false health claims. And I think there have been some examples of that already. Um, so so I, I do believe that they will take action. Yeah. Yeah. Would anybody else want to comment on the questions? Okay. Is it difficult to prove illegal marijuana use in court? Once you get to court, <laughs> is that <laughs> difficult to prove? Well, it isn't. It, it's not illegal anymore. <laughs> right. So the only illegality involved is driving while you're, you know, under the influence of marijuana. But one of the interesting 
things, and it's been alluded to by some of the medical professionals. The reason, unlike alcohol, where we have a correlation between the amount of alcohol in your bloodstream and its capacity, if you will, to impact your motor coordination to the point that you are driving impaired is because we've done tests after test after test to do that. We don't do that with marijuana. We've never done it with marijuana because marijuana is still a federally illegal substance. So medical professionals can't do the kinds of studies that resulted in us having the knowledge that a 0.8 blood alcohol concentration is going to correlate to impairment. We don't, we don't have any idea what correlates to impairment from the ingestion of marijuana. So we've got, you know, people smoking this stuff, using edibles, and then driving around all over the place. I think um, because some of the other questions I have have already been answered um, partly, so, and it is getting late, so I'm going to have uh, each of the panelists give five minutes. And um, Chris, do you want to start? Sure. Thanks. Sure. I, I don't, I don't, can you hear me? Oh, yeah. I was in a classroom before. If kids in the back row listen, shall, I'll tell you. Uh, if in 1972, when I started working with families and youth around issues of mental health and substance use, you had told me I'd be here participating in this forum tonight, I probably would have accused you of operating under the influence. So here I am tonight to say that the commercialization of marijuana in our communities is not harmless, but it rather is a significant public health risk. We need to think very seriously and differently because we're not talking about the issue of legalization anymore, but rather how do we advocate for the health and safety of our residents, especially our children and adolescents. The message that's accompanying legalization, unfortunately, has become it's no big deal, everyone is doing it, what's the problem? The problem is that this almost daily normalization message disregards the adverse effects on both individuals and our community. There are many health issues. We have spent many years and countless dollars on educating our children and adults about the significant consequences of smoking tobacco and even the dangers of secondhand smoke. Warning statements appear on wrappers. Sales are controlled and advertising is prohibited but interestingly, I was in Scandinavia this summer where their packaging on cigarettes is actually pictures of lung cancer surgery patients. It's the darndest thing you've ever seen. Research from places such as Canada and California described the toxins in marijuana cigarettes such as ammonia and hydrogen cyanide as up to 20 times higher than tobacco. Patients with regular use of marijuana cigarettes display increased coughs, sputum, airway inflammation, wheezing, and even blood vessel issues. In the meantime, e-cigarette use with flavored products and even marijuana oils is exploding to the point that the FDA this past week ordered the five major brands to submit plans to them within the next 60 days on how they will prevent teens from using their products. The risk to our children's health and well-being is growing and likely to get worse. Cape-wide schools are reporting the escalation of students both vaping and using marijuana during the school day, and the response to their adults is often, everyone's doing it and what's the problem? It is well researched and established, and it's been discussed here, that regular marijuana use by individuals under the age of 24 has significant impacts on developing brains. It impacts memory, impulse control, problem solving, and emotional regulations are all amongst the issues cited. Growing bodies of research here and in other countries around the world support the conclusion that regular use from an early age is linked to developing psychosis and other psychiatric illnesses. Some studies cite that one in six adolescents who regularly use cannabis will become addicted. A study reported this week discussed the findings that women who used marijuana during their pregnancies and postpartum had THC in their breast milk. No research exists yet as to the effect on fetus and neonatal child development. The American Psychiatric Association in 2013 established both <coughs> cannabis use disorder and cannabis withdrawal syndrome 
in their DSM-5 manual. With both legalization and easy retail access in our communities, we should be very concerned about the use of marijuana on the health and development of our youth. Many try to assure us that marijuana is no big deal as alcohol is legal. What's the difference? The problem is that alcohol use and the issues of its abuse as a standard is dangerous for our communities. Alcohol is already the major basis of impaired driving crashes. It's estimated that 28 percent of all auto deaths are alcohol related and that there are 100,000 deaths per year related to alcohol causes. The justification excuse of this should not be acceptable to a community. Police chiefs throughout the state are clear about their concerns about public safety on our roads with marijuana impaired drivers. The lack of any sort of breathalyzer testing at this time, as we've discussed, is very troubling to them as we all read reports of small surveys done of marijuana smokers now reporting that they see no problem with using and driving and there appears to be a sense of no issues with the ability to drive while they're using and a decreased potential of the potential harm or perception of potential harm. This Thus, all, even non-users, are being subjected to more risk at this point in our communities. So when we look at the issues around the adverse impacts of retail commercialization of marijuana on our youth, citizens, and communities, I repeat as I have for the past 46 years, this is not what a healthy, vibrant community needs or su should support. We should be saying, it is a big deal. Not everyone is doing it. It is a problem. And there is no corner store where you can buy marijuana in this town. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you very much. Who would like to go next? I concur. Yes. I pass. <laughs> I'll just run with that. I think I made enough points, and I'm, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Thanks for having for me. Thanks for the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Thanks for hanging in there. Okay. And not being rude or disrespectful, it's very appreciated. Thank you for that. Great audience. Mm -hmm. Yes. I feel the same way. I think we, we made, I, I mm -hmm. certainly made some good points about prevention. Uh, the DA talked about a program called Karma Choice. Uh, Gosnold has counselors now in 51 schools. You know, it's, it's sort of a sad commentary. In 2014, we started a school-based counseling program with one part-time clinician in a high school a substance abuse counselor because that's what we thought we needed. And four years later, the majority of the schools that we're in are elementary schools. We're helping a lot of children, we're helping a lot of families, but it's a sad commentary on many of the things we've talked about tonight. And I would only say to people, because first and foremost, I'm a parent, I am a prevention professional, and now I work in public relations and in development at Gosnold, fundraising. I have the opportunity to talk to, fun, to, to funders, and when I ask them for money, I talk about the kids, and I talk about what it's doing to our culture. Mm -hmm. And the least favorite part of my job is parents that call me to start memorial funds in their children's names. Mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. That is the least favorite part of my job. And many of those kids that are dying are my son's age, and they talk about how they loved their children. They started out with thinking it was okay to have a party in their basement, mm -hmm. thinking that it was okay for their son or their daughter to smoke pot because it was just pot, and what it turned to. And does it always? No, it doesn't. But I don't think we need to add one more drug to the crisis that we're already in. So thank you so much for listening. I appreciate it. That's hard to follow. <laughs> it really is. I mean, that real life, you know, mm -hmm. day to day, um, I think, interaction with families mm -hmm. and individuals, you know, that, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. many of you do, I, th I think can't be beat. I mean, I think that's the most compelling, um, compelling point that, that can be made. I mean, I can have all the, the science, all the research behind it, but I think what it comes down to is, you know, the, what's the bottom line? And it's, it's that behind all of this, there are individuals, there are families that will be hurt. And someone recently said to me, I don't understand why you oppose this. I, you know, mm -hmm. are you a prohibitionist is what I get all the time. I'm like, mm -hmm. no, but I can tell you that more people will die because this, mm -hmm. you know, after legalization because of this than they would have before. So to me, that's the benchmark. And I think it's, 
it's sad to me that I'm raising my three young children mm -hmm. in, in a culture where, where there is an increased normalization of substance use rather than a decrease. Um, so I'll, I just will reiterate um, just the basic points of prevention here, and, and they are just that the factors that contribute to youth substance use, regardless of what that substance is, and lead to an increased risk of addiction are well documented in the scientific literature. These factors include increased access and availability of a given substance, reduced perception of harm, and reduced perception of disapproval mm -hmm. of use, resulting in increased social and cultural normalization of substance use. And these factors, they've clearly contributed to the opioid epidemic, the relatively high rates of alcohol addiction and alcohol-related death, and nicotine addiction uh, historically have been tobacco and cigarettes, but now vaping, uh, jewels, and, and other e-cigarettes. So um, I think in a statement by Dr. Eden Evans, she's the founder and director of the Center for Addiction at Mass General Hospital, she recently said, and I mean, she kind of summed this up, repeated marijuana use in adolescents can cause lasting changes in brain function that jeopardize educational, professional, and social achievement. The effects of a drug on individual health are determined not only by biology, but also by its availability and social acceptability. Mm. Essentially that these are driven by commercialization. The legal drugs, alcohol and tobacco, account for the greatest burden of disease associated with drugs, not because they are more dangerous than other drugs, but because their legal status and commercialization causes more widespread use. Mm -hmm. Thank you, great quote. I started my career as an emergency physician in Taunton in the year 2000. One of the members of the audience is actually one of, was one of my partners in that hospital. And um, back then, an opiate overdose was an unusual thing. It happened, but it wasn't a daily occurrence. Mm -hmm. There was very, there was some mental health issues, but it wasn't an overpowering issue then. In the 18 years since then, I have been in the front lines witnessing the ever-growing problem of opiate addiction and mental health issues in this state and in the country. And there is a correlation between increased substance abuse, not just opiates, but marijuana, um, prescription drugs, the whole gambit. There is a direct correlation between substance use and the amount of mental illness, mental illness in our society. And I firmly believe the more we normalize marijuana, the worse it's going to get. I'm seeing more and more young people abusing marijuana and coming to the ER with mood disorders and mental health issues. And the more we normalize it, the worse it's going to get. I'm a father. I'm a scoutmaster. I'm a member of your community. I am not an expert in addiction medicine. I'm someone who's on the front lines, and I see this every day. The more we normalize this, the worse it's going to get. It's out there with alcohol. And everyone says, well, marijuana is safer than alcohol. It isn't. It's <laughs> just different. Mm -hmm. It's going to give you, if anything, it's going to give you more mood-altering, long-term mental health issues. And if that's what you want for your community, go ahead and push this. But that is what you're getting. That is what you're asking for. And I, I beg you not to make this more normal. It's already an issue. We don't need it to be more of an issue than it is. Thank you. Sure. So I'm, I'm going to summarize uh, just in blatant numbers. 94% of the inmates in the House of Correction, 94% are drug addicted or alcohol addicted. 62% of those had their first drug of choice was cannabis, whereas only 19% first experiment with alcohol. That's a huge statistic. Educationally, we talked about how many people didn't make it through school. 46% of that population never graduated high school and 53% first started with cannabis. Cannabis finds itself again in, in the main category. Mental health, 58% of the inmates report being duly diagnosed. 70% of those first started with cannabis, a huge statistic. More importantly, it's a criminal behavior. 54% said that they did their crime because they wanted to get drugs, <coughs> whereas 78% reported they did it because they were under the influence. Is it possible to think that if the first drug that they ever abused wasn't there, 
that they wouldn't currently be in there. Mm -hmm. So do you want this stuff in your community? Because if you do, you're going to swell our ranks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to read your bio um, before you speak <laughs> so people know what else you've done. Um, Michael O'Keefe, the Cape and Islands District Attorney, is deeply involved in the Cape community, helping combat the opioid um, crisis through early prevention, education, and treatment programs. He served on the board of the Campaign for a Safe and Healthy Massachusetts, the official opposition effort against the legalization of recreational pot. He has also worked with other DAs across Massachusetts to address the public safety concerns of marijuana use, particularly the l risk of marijuana impaired drivers. So thank you very much. <laughs> if five I minutes. Okay. <laughs> I, I just, you know, I've talked about this so often, it's, it's almost, um, you know, I get, I get frankly tired of it. You know, you voted for this. I said, I've, I've, I've talked about this so often, I'm tired of it. You voted for this. Okay? Now, let me, let me suggest something to you. And Yale Medical School published a study in uh, 2014. Don't take my, anybody can read it. Go online. The Journal of Adolescent Medicine. And they reluctantly concluded that, you know, those people who have said marijuana is a gateway drug are right. Mm -hmm. And they, the study was based on a, a bunch of kids who had smoked dope when they were 12, 13, 14. Then went on to go to college to get a good job. And then they got in a, the kind of accident where they fell off the turnip truck and they were prescribed an opiate. And those kids were, who had been successful up to that point, stopped smoking dope, went to college, had a very good job, they were two and a half times more likely to not be able to get off the legally prescribed opiate and then therefore turn to street heroin. And, uh, you know, then the kids who had never smoked marijuana as youngsters. So Yale Medical School concluded that <coughs> there is a correlation there, obviously. And why is that correlation? Because Yale Medical School concluded that the same receptors in the brain that THC attached to are the receptors that opiates attach to. So the kid has pre-wired his brain to ultimately become an opiate user and ultimately a heroin user. So when, you, when I hear everybody's angst over the opiate crisis, we're, we've just created the next generation of opiate users with the widespread dissemination of this drug. Thank you. I also want to uh, just recommend this book to you. It's the 21 Unspoken Truths of Marijuana, and it's by a doctor. His name is Antoine, or Antone, I guess, Kana Maguri. Uh, very simple to read. You've been reading about it an hour. Um, and I just want to read one quote from it because you were just talking about this. Every time you put illicit drugs into your body, you are putting a certain stress on your brain. And at some point, you might experience a reaction you've never experienced before. These reactions might include psychosis, anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts, or dangerously <coughs> deadly behaviors. So somebody could be using drugs for a long time, but what the doctor is saying, after a while, that stress just makes something snap inside you. So I'll leave you with that. And thank you so much for being such a great audience. I thank the panelists. Thank you for coming out tonight and spending all this time trying to educate our town. And our Bourne did vote against 
the marijuana. So we are proud of that. Mm -hmm. But thank you so much. Wonderful.